Anyway, okay. So as, as Ben introduced me, my name's Jake Hadfield. Um, this presentation was actually created by me and my wife. We both work for USU Extension. Um, I actually got my master's degree in animal nutrition, mainly livestock nutrition, and my wife got hers in meat science. So we joke that I raise the animals and then she does the rest. So anyway, um, we just wanted to talk about raising meat rabbits because one, me and my wife are actually, um, we live in a, a subdivision area um, we have a little bit of land that we can use. Um, and so this is something that we're doing because we both grew up on small farms, but we want an opportunity to raise livestock now. Um, and this raising rabbits is an opportunity that you can do in a very small area and be able to still have the enjoyment of raising livestock. So to begin out this presentation, first of all, I just wanted to mention there's, there's kind of some different areas that rabbits are used in. First of all, rabbits are generally known as pets or companions. And so a lot of what you see research wise is kind of on if when you're searching for information, you're going to see a lot of information about pets. You also will see a lot of information about show and hobby rabbits. I mean, they have associations and everything oriented around showing these rabbits. Um, but what we're talking about when we're talking about meat rabbits is food and fiber that we're raising these rabbits for a product. So when you're searching for information on this topic, it's just really important that you're looking for specifically either commercial or meat specific um, rabbit research. And so with any category, I always tell people, try to look for information that comes from EDU sites, um, just because that information is usually research vetted so that you can be able to know that it's accurate. Um, and that's important. So if you're ever curious about something, you can always type a certain topic like meat rabbits, and then you can either type things such as USU or EDU, and it'll bring up research based. Most of your what you find on Google will bring up research based information. So moving on, let's talk a little bit more about food and fiber. So I guess the first question is why meat rabbits? And so this is an overview slide of what I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk about the nutrition of rabbit meat. I'm also going to talk about economics, their practical use, and multi-purpose ability. Um, so first, when we're talking about nutrition, there's some things we think about when we think about meat. We think about protein, cholesterol, as well as calorie intake. So if we're going to look at rabbit meat, this graph here shows the percentage of protein in different types of meat. And what we find in rabbits specifically is that they actually have some of the highest, their meat contains the highest protein per a thousand grams. So basically we're getting a lot of bang for our buck by eating rabbit meat. It's even higher than what we might see in pork, beef, or lamb. And so with great protein, a lot of times we also see problems with having too high fats. So if we're looking at cholesterol overall, another benefit, and this is one of the awesome parts that we see with rabbit meat, is even though it has the high protein, it still has a lower cholesterol level than what we even see in chicken, as well as our beef and pork. So really, we're getting really good bang for our buck. And last but not least, when we are thinking about the nutrition, when we're thinking about calories, what we see is rabbit is actually the, one of the least calories per pound, very similar to chicken. And as we know, when we're you know in our diets, we're always trying to get the most bang for our buck in the fact that we want nu nutrient dense foods that are gonna provide us you know, a lot. Um, and that's, that's really what rabbit meat does for us. It really can have a positive impact on the diet. I'm just gonna let you know overall, um, I have not tried rabbit meat. I know I'm trying to get into the rabbit business and I have never tried it in my life, but I have heard it's very similar to chicken in the taste as well as the um, texture of it. And so just to give you an idea of what rabbit meat is like, um, moving on talking about the economics of rabbits. So one of the reasons a lot of people consider rabbits is because there's a low startup cost to getting started. Um, there's things you got to consider with your costs. You're going to have to get housing, supplies, feed, as well as you're going to have to get the rabbits themselves. And so let's look a little deeper. So this, for instance, is a pen that you could use here. And this is just an example. This says approximately 300 bucks, but this slideshow was created before Corona even and before lumber prices spiked. So it's probably a little bit more than that by now. Um, but it gives you an idea that you can create something, you know, for a few hundred dollars that your rabbits can use. And, and this is just one example. There's many more examples you can use. I don't know how many of you have heard of tractors 
where you can move those rabbits around, around your yard. Um, there's different pens you can have. You can have metal pens, you can have, um, you know, wider, bigger pens. It's, it's up to you in the space that you have, but there are many options that you can get away um, with, especially due to the low space requirements required for rabbits. Now, when you're looking for supplies, we don't necessarily endorse any one place, but here's just a list of some places you could look. Um, I mean, your local feed stores such as IFA, Cal Ranch, Tractor Supply, those are all great places to look. There are some websites you can look at as well, as well as you can just build your own from your own, you know, going out and buying supplies alone. Now, just to give you an idea of what the price is going to be in order to be able to get started at least with one rabbit, is you're going to need cages in order to house these rabbits. You're also going to need nest boxes. This is especially, this is mainly true if you want to do breeding rabbits. Um, feeders you'll need as well as water bottles. But you can see this whole set of equipment that we have here is about $60. And so honestly, you can get a good set of equipment pretty early on starting out um, for a pretty decent price. Now, of course, you know, while this equipment is important, probably the more important and probably the most expensive overall is going to be your feed. Because over time, you're going to continually have to feed these animals and your feed's going to continue to increase. And so you just want to make sure that you have access to both pellets as well as hay to feed these animals to be able to provide for them. Now, last but not least, we need to talk about the rabbits. So if you're thinking about getting into meat rabbits, one of the things that is always suggested is that you start with a trio. Now, why you wanna start with a trio is because you want enough genetic diversity in your herd that you can actually pull back some of your, you know, some of the kits or the rabbits that you have um, back into your breeding system. And by having a trio, it allows you to have enough genetic diversity to do that. Now, when you're looking for meat rabbits, you're gonna be looking anywhere from zero to $200 a rabbit. My wife and I have been looking around. Um, we found, my wife is involved with a little bit more of the show world as well, because there are show meat rabbits. Um, but we were looking at rabbits that were between 100 and $120, but those were on the show end. Um, we've seen other commercial rabbits anywhere from 60 to 80. So really there is a large price range, but you're gonna wanna make sure that the trio that you get comes from the same breeder. That is very important because you wanna make sure that your rabbits are gonna be genetically compatible. And so when you start with the trio, it's important to find a good breeder who's already started out so that you can be able to start with this trio in order to get your breeding program established. Now, sorry, I'm not clicking on the right side. Let me go back here. Um, on the practical end of things, there's some important considerations to have as well. First of all, Rabbits are very clean animals. Um, there's really no odor if it's managed correctly. Um, if you have them in an inside shelter, you just need to make sure there's good airflow. Um, but overall, we have a pet rabbit in our house um, and there really is no odor when we make sure that we're on top of it and just correctly cleaning uh, our rabbit's cage. They're also quiet. There's really no crowing involved like you'd see with chickens. Um, the loudest thing that I've heard rabbits do is they thump with their feet, but honestly, that's only when they're really annoyed, and usually that's pretty quiet as well. Um, as I mentioned before, these animals are very space efficient. Um, for one rabbit specifically, a 24 by 36 inch cage is appropriate. Now, you might not want to do the cage setup. You might want to be doing a tractor or something else, and that works great, but that's just important to know for the minimum requirements of space that these animals need. Um, next, these animals are very fast growing. Their gestation is only 30 days. So from breeding until there's a, a litter of kits born, you, it's only a month and you already got a litter of kits on the ground. Um, those kits that are born are ready to harvest at eight to 12 weeks. So it really is a quick turnover process overall. Um, last but not least, um, rabbits are actually very easy to process. Um, it's less mess than chicken or other livestock. And so that's something to consider, especially with this process, especially if you're um, considering doing this for your own food storage as well. Now, rabbits are also multi-purpose. And this is one nice thing is, first of all, we're gonna be getting the rabbit meat from these animals, but there's also fiber and pelts. Now, some of you might not really wanna do the rabbit meat side of things, um, and you can get involved with Angora rabbits to be able to sell the furs that they have. 
However, um, your meat rabbits are also going to be able to get a pelt. Um, and when you are selling meat rabbits specifically, there are actually premiums that can be awarded for um, high quality pelts. Last but not least, and this one doesn't get thinked about, thought about as much, is having fertilizer. Um, these rabbits, the waste that they produce is actually perfect for gardens. It can be applied directly on. Um, but there's also been a lot going on lately that people really like adding rabbit manure into compost due to just the levels of nutrients it has. Um, and it just, it's very dry, very easy to apply, um, just works really well as a fertilizer overall. So with that, it's important that we look into getting started. And so now we are going full in on our meat rabbits. So first of all, we want to talk about selection, how to select these animals that are going to be good quality for the, their meat. Um, we also want to talk about care, how to care for these animals, as well as the meat rabbit cycle, talking about how the breeding system would be set up or just raising these animals from kits to full grown overall. Now, when we're thinking about selection, it's important that we have a breed in mind that we want to shoot for. So in rabbits in general, there are 47 recognized breeds, a ton of breeds. Over, there are over 15 commercial breeds or meat-based breeds. So there are a lot of breeds to choose from, <coughs> excuse me. But right here, I have a list of the top four. So the top four are California, New Zealand, Palomino and Satins. And I'm gonna talk about these in a little more detail here in just a minute. But to show you kind of what we're selecting for here, I've got the difference between a pet rabbit and a meat rabbit. So the rabbit on the left, I believe is a Holland Lop, which is more of our pet rabbit size or a show rabbit um, size, which is only four pounds. And as you can see on that rabbit, there's not a lot of product behind it. However, if you look on the other side on this, this is what we call a California white. Um, that rabbit is 10 pounds. Um, and the rabbit itself, the 10 pound rabbit here, you can just see is a lot more compact. It's a lot more scent like it kind of has that, that cylinder shape. And you can just see that that animal has a lot more um, weight behind it. Now, if you look over here on this next picture, if it will go, there it goes. Um, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. What we see is now you can see on the left here is what we call a checkered giant. This animal is 12 plus pounds. So it's a heavier animal. You're thinking, well, there's obviously more product on it but you can see that it's extremely leggy. There's a lot of leg, whereas your California white on the right is extremely compact. And so that's an, another important thing you're gonna look at for selection, because you can also see this is a different breed called New Zealand white. Um, you can see there's a difference there. And I'm actually gonna show you this different um, difference when comparing carcasses. So if you look at these rabbit carcasses here, what you're gonna see is both these rabbits, so these are different breeds of rabbits, the top, carcass is a checkered giant. The bottom carcass is a New Zealand white. Both of these rabbits were six months old. Both were pedigreed, both healthy, both had, were free fed pellets. Um, and basically what you're seeing is the difference in the overall carcass. Now you, you're gonna look at this and you're gonna see, well, the checkered giant was four pounds, 3.4 ounces. And the New Zealand white was four pounds, 15.8 ounces, which you're like, well, that's not a big deal. But you gotta remember that if you're selling this product, this product is gonna be sold by the pound. And one of the things with rabbits is that rabbits in general, you're gonna be selling a lot of them just due to their high breeding frequency and how short of a turnaround they have. And so if you can get that extra half pound or even more than that, that really will be more economic overall. Now, when we're talking about the specific breeds, one thing to keep in mind is there's a lot of mixed breeds available and mixed breeds can be great. It's just important that you make sure your mixed breeds are focused on the sole purpose for meat. Um, probably the fastest growing and most popular meat breed of rabbit overall is gonna be our California white, which this breed is very unique just because it has its black points where it has black ears, black nose, black feet and black tail. Um, this animal really does really is a very fast growing, very proficient um, overall. And honestly, there's premiums to be had with the pelt as well because it is white. So uh, people are willing to pay more money for that pelt because it can be dyed. And so that's one reason that California whites are chosen so much. There's also New Zealand whites, 
which are chosen a lot because of their white pelt as well. Plus these animals are also very fast growing and very efficient. Um, there are different colors of New Zealand. There isn't just white, but the main meat breed that you're probably gonna see is the New Zealand white overall. We also see that Palomino is another breed. Now this breed doesn't get as big or as large as our, those other two breeds I mentioned before. However, some people just really like the color on the Palomino. And so they choose to use this over those other breeds. One of the last, the last breed we're gonna talk about <coughs> is the satin. Now the satin is unique because of its specific fur type. Satins come in many colors. Full grown satins are gonna be about 11 pounds. Um, but overall, these rabbits can be really eye catching. So some people really enjoy getting into these. Um, but again, this won't, won't necessarily get as big as what our New Zealand white or California whites will but it will be um, still, it'll be a decent animal and be more in the eight to 10 pound range rather than the 10 to 12 pound range. So next we need to kind of talk about care and I'm gonna kind of, I'm sorry I'm going fast. I just don't wanna go over on time here. Um, but when we're talking about care of meat rabbits, it's important that we think about feeding and water. So when we're thinking about feeding, there's some things we really need to understand about rabbits before we get into that. The first thing is, is rabbits can't vomit. That is an important part of this process. Once you feed a rabbit something, there is only one exit and that's the only way it can go. So it's important that we're feeding these animals certain foods to make sure that they're not gonna get sick and that they're gonna be able to process them. These animals, rabbits are also known as what are cecotrophs. And what that basically means is that these animals actually get part of their nutrient requirements from eating their own feces. And so I'm gonna talk about this in a little more detail so you can have a better understanding. But when we're thinking about livestock species, one of the things that we focus on and can help us really manage this diet is that rabbits and horses are probably the closest related livestock species overall, um, especially when it comes to digestion. They are really closely related. And so there's a lot of similarities we can drive between the two. So okay, this next- got, You have five minutes left. Five minutes, okay. Well, Tell questions. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I love this title of this next slide. This is my wife here, clever. Um, the scoop on poop. So like I mentioned, these rabbits are cecotrophs. And so the rabbits actually have two type of pellets they produce. They produce feces as well as cecal pellets. Now, one of the things that we see with the cecal pellets um, as a rabbit is digesting food for the first time, what's going to happen is their cecal flora or cecal bacteria that will actually produce essential nutrients such as fatty acid and vitamins that the rabbit can't get on their own. And that's why these rabbits are actually going to eat their own feces is because they eat this to be able to absorb those nutrients on the second time through. And so after the second time through, what we're going to see is these hard dry pellets are gonna be coming through on that second time and the rabbits will not eat these. Um, this is why with rabbits, we're gonna try and focus on a low protein and high fiber diet is because the high fiber, one of the reasons these animals do this process is it allows them to digest high fiber really efficiently. And so we're gonna want a lower protein and a higher fiber to be able to help these animals continue to function and their di keep their digestive system moving along. Now, some of the basics that need to know, this says pet rabbits here, um, but this is more important for breeding rabbits is that your breeding rabbits are gonna need feeds formulated with 12 to 16% protein. The rabbits that you're specifically growing more on the meat side of things is actually gonna be more of a probably higher like the 16 to 18 range. Um, your commercial feeds that you're gonna get or commercial pellets have all the necessary nutrients that your rabbits are gonna need but you might consider adding a small trace mineral salt spool just to make sure that those rabbits are getting adequate minerals in their diet as well. Now, one of the most important parts for the longevity of a rabbit is that you wanna make sure you include hay in the diet. Now, your meat rabbits that you're growing specifically for meat, a lot of times those rabbits are not gonna need hay. They can actually grow fully out on pellets. However, your rabbits that are breeding that you're gonna be using in your breeding system will need hay. And hay just aids in the proper digestion, helps these animals really um, be able to digest efficiently, but it also just helps them to maintain, a kind of maintain 
over a long period of time. We want to make sure we're using hays that are low in protein, such as grass hays. I know popular hays that people are using are things such as Timothy or orchard grass. Um, these grass hays are best. Uh, alfalfa hay tends to be a little too high in protein. And one of the things with rabbits is that they're actually susceptible to urinary calculi, um, which basically is from too much protein in the diet. And so that urinary calculi can cause large problems overall. So it's important that we try and avoid that if we can. Now, one of the things with these breeding rabbits is you're going to want to make sure that you include free choice hay, but you got to understand that these rabbits are going to eat about approximately their body size of hay every day. So just to make sure you keep that full and keep that moving through. Now, one thing we will say, and I'm going to fly through this, plain pellets are best. So you want just a regular pellet, low protein, high fiber, like I've been mentioning with the hay, avoid pellets that have seeds, grains, or dried fruits. These can cause problems just because, like I mentioned, the rabbits can't vomit. So you want to keep a pretty homogenous pellet that is pretty regular. Now, when you're thinking about the amount that you need to feed, you've got to think about one fourth cup of 16% protein pellets for every six pounds of body weight daily. So really, you're not going to be feeding these animals a lot, but that is a good rule of thumb to have. However, there is an exception that the free choice that you can give pellets free choice when your does are lactating or your babies are continuing to grow. So um, I'm going to go fly through this. Fruits are snacks. You can feed rabbits fruits, but don't do too many. Um, dark veggies are OK, but you're going to want to avoid iceberg lettuce and avoid veggies that cause gas buildup, such as kale and beans. So I'm gonna skip over that. Um, make sure that they have plenty of water, ample water. Okay, now I wanna hit on this. Sorry, I'm gonna fly through this, Ben, but meat rabbit cycle. One of the cool things is if you bought kits today, you could have meat in your freezer in six months. So basically your bucks can breed as early as six months, as well as your does can breed as early as eight months. If you're thinking about breeding, it takes eight to 12 weeks for kits to reach their full growth. Um, as I mentioned earlier, gestation is a month. One doe can produce six to eight kits. Um, you wean your kits at six to eight weeks. Uh, does should be allowed to recoup after rebreeding. So you're going to want to make sure they have two to six weeks to recoup before you breed them again. Um, I'll skip over that. Okay, harvesting at home. Here's some resources for that. I'm not going to cover that today. Um, and with that, sorry, I had to fly through those last slides, but if you have questions or would like some of these resources, please email me at jacob.hadfield.usu.edu. So Ben, I'll turn it over to you.